Hey, uh, so I thought I'd do this um, video um, kind of as a, um, offering my perspective to a video that Sylvie just um, shot. Uh, this actually would make a great Muay Thai Bones topic, and maybe we'll move it over to the Muay Thai Bones. But when Phil, Sylvie was filming her recent um, Sylvie answering interesting questions video, she kept saying to me, why don't you shoot a video? Um, and uh, she went to training and I was thinking to myself, um, yeah, maybe uh, there could be some interesting things to say. Um, so I encourage you to go watch her video. One of the cool things about us is that Sylvie's the fighter and she's the one honestly with the in-depth knowledge. Um, but um, I have this kind of like outsider view. I've been there uh, filming uh, with all uh, the legends for the Muay Thai library and I'm not the fighter but I've been present in so much of her training so I have a kind of like outsider view. So it's really cool. The question was um, how do you watch Muay Thai fights from a Redditor? Um, not to her, it was just broadly asked. He was uh, new to the sport and he wanted to know kind of like what to look at um, coming to the sport, watching uh, contemporary fights, but maybe even older fights too. And so Sylvie's answer is kind of the fighter's answer. A lot of it is what she looks for as a fighter, points of affinity um, between her own body and actions and knowledge and those displayed in the ring. Um, I'm coming at it from a different perspective, so maybe our two answers together would be kind of a, give wider context. I'm also, if, for those of you that watch the Muay Thai Bones podcast, I'm super philosophical and conceptual. I like big ideas being communicated, um, found in the art and sport of Muay Thai. So this answer also kind of like widens out to some of those things. So how do you watch Muay Thai? Um, the first, maybe um, more obvious thing is that the traditional Muay Thai, Stadium Muay Thai of Thailand, even though it's changed quite a bit since the golden age of the late 80s and 90s, um, when it's widely acknowledged that was the peak of the sport, when the best fighters fought, uh, the largest talent pool, they were the biggest spar st uh, stars of the sport. Um, it's changed a lot since then. Uh, the talent pool is much reduced and um, rules have changed and influences on the sport have changed and largely thought that the uh, skill sets of uh, Muay Thai fighters today are more limited. Uh, there's, a, there's a shrunken down vocabulary. Um, but Muay Thai in Thailand as a whole, even across all these changes is quite scored quite differently than in other uh, parts of the world. Um, major things to think about when watching uh, traditional stadium Muay Thai is uh, aggression alone is not, um, does not earn you points. Uh, chasing someone around the ring, throwing lots of strikes, many of them off balance or uh, missing does not get you points. Uh, being the more active fighter does not get you points and very often th these kinds of things in the West uh, are seen as general goods. In Thailand they actually might, uh, you might lose points if you're the chasing fighter, uh, you're very often losing, that's a sign that you're losing. Uh, if you throw strikes that miss repeatedly even if they look badass and uh, would make great highlight moments. Um, you actually can lose points uh, for missed strikes. Uh, not always though. Um, and just overall aggression is read differently because it's a Buddhistic country. Um, and what is prized in traditional fighting is uh, control. Uh, control over yourself. That's why overt aggression sometimes is looked down upon. But control over your opponent control over your opponent's space uh, and the space between the two of you. So 
Uh, that's a really big thing to have to digest if you're watching a uh, traditional um, stadium Muay Thai. Uh, if you're watching things that are basically, there's newer promotions that are basically trying to transform Thailand's Muay Thai into kickboxing or an international style like one or some of these three round promotions like uh, Super Champ or whatnot. Um, there, the, the older concepts of aggression uh, have been uh, eroded and reversed. And uh, in those kinds of promotions, uh, being more active, more aggressive, as more, as more commonly thought in the West and maybe in a global concept of fighting, uh, your, your more natural instincts towards aggression might serve you better. But in Thailand, it's about control and dominance and not uh, necessarily uh, seeking damage. Uh, yes, damage is important because damage allows you to control your opponent, but, the, but in the higher levels of the sport, you also control your opponent sometimes without hurting them just by positioning yourself, uh, or you control your opponent through, psychologically through posture. Um, so these are some of the really interesting things about Thailand's Muay Thai, that the point system actually awards a subtle variety of qualities in a fighter that are not video game qualities. Um, and in that way, I think it promotes a much more nuanced, complete, and um, skillful fighter. Uh, um, and the kinds of skills that would win in an actual fight, like in a hypothetical fight. Um, ways of countering aggression that you might get or some, some such. So that's a, that's a broader concept. It's like if you're watching Stadium Muay Thai, you have to get used to this idea that damage and aggression isn't always the highest form of scoring. Um, so with that in mind, and I'm no expert here. I've uh, been in Thailand, I think we've been here eight years. I've personally seen hundreds and hundreds of cards. Um, I do watch contemporary Muay Thai. Uh, there are people more knowledgeable than me, for sure. But this is just my perspective, my personal connection to watching Muay Thai. What I look at in, uh, when I watch a Muay Thai fight, whether it be a golden age fight on uh, YouTube or a contemporary fight. I actually use this to watch all fight styles. Um, UFC, which I don't watch very often, but when do you watch a UFC fight? Um, these kickboxing type shows, um, any uh, form of fighting. My eyes, I kind of like uh, f blur out the fighters at times. And I mostly focus on the empty space between the fighters. Um, in MMA, it's a little less instructive because of MMA distance, that fighters take a uh, much greater distance uh, than in other styles, supposedly in fear of the takedown or in defense of the takedown. I think also it's evolved that way because uh, defensive skills are not rewarded so much in uh, the UFC. There's a great article in Fight Site about this, actually. Uh, defensive skills are not scored highly. So f fighters in the UFC tend to evolve very uh, robust offensive games and their defensive skills um, are less highly developed. Like things like positioning, angling, um, controlling the space uh, while in it. So uh, I think MMA distance kind of like grew out of this kind of um, slightly lopsided scoring system uh, because defensive skills are not as highly evolved and rewarded. Uh, fighters tend to take more distance because taking distance from an opponent is um, one of the easiest ways, the simplest ways uh, to um, control a fight. But still, it's instructive to watch in this way. So generally what I'm doing is I'm watching this uh, space in between the fighters. And I'm watching how it, I picture it almost like a bubble under tension. Um, and as the fighters come together, just like a, a ball or something, it gets compressed and you get this like 
energy that's happening. Um, in lower level fighting skill sets and styles, what ends up happening with this bubble is the fighters stay away and then a fighter commits to like going through the fight zone and very often at the lower skill levels they'll blast through this bubble to the other side um, and throw a violent combination or use aggression to like pierce the bubble and stun or disable or um, kind of like shrink the awareness of their opponent as they got through it. Um, and that's one reason why clinch is very important in uh, maintaining clinch in Muay Thai rules is so important is because there's a consequence in Muay Thai if you get through that bubble and you close that distance. Uh, in more kickboxing oriented promotions, because there's no clinching, even in let's say one championship Muay Thai, which is called Muay Thai, but it's kind of really like Muay Thai as kickboxing, uh, because there's no um, clinch, there's no consequence of once you collapse that bubble, um, now there's grappling. In, per, uh, in MMA, there is a consequence because there's grappling and takedowns once you collapse that bubble. It's important for the full art of fighting to, once that fighter crosses that bubble, for there to be now requiring a skill set of proximity. And that's why, for me, personally, kickboxing type rules are actually dumbing down the sport because they eliminate that consequence. The ref just comes in and start over again, start over again, start over, just so you get these like clashes through the bow. So this leads to, um, for me, the real pleasure of watching Muay Thai, uh, a traditional Muay Thai, is that the best fighters, especially in the golden age, they don't fight outside the bubble, generally. They fight in that bubble. They stand, it's been compared sometimes like to fighting fish, uh, Siamese fighting fish where they're like very still, but then suddenly like flare up. The best fighters possess the defensive and offensive skills, the like complete fluency to stand in that space of danger and to remain out of danger. Um, you actually get, I, the only other fighting sport that's kind of like this to me, that, that celebrates the skills within the fight bubble is boxing. Um, because which also like Muay Thai has a 120 year uh, fight culture history. And it's actually very influenced by Western boxing from the 1920s on. Uh, so there's no coincidence that these two um, hundred year fighting sports um, possess uh, these higher level skills. So um, when I say that I'm watching that, in, I'm not watching the fighters, I'm watching this bubble and how each fighter is withstanding the pressure and dealing with the pressure and then using that bubble. Like if you're fighting a fighter who doesn't like being in the bubble, let's say they like to protect themselves with distance. So they're comfortable with distance. If you're a pressuring fighter, you don't want to stand outside the bubble and then rush across. It would be a low level kind of fighting. It's like stand outside the bubble rush across with some dynamic move or pure aggression and damage, try to damage this distancing fighter. A higher level of uh, fighting skill is as the pressuring fighter, and actually there's a contemporary fight that did this that was very, very cool that I want to do a little voiceover on. Uh, you use that bubble like it's a yoga ball and you use it and you pressurize your opponent through footwork and proximity and your own ability to defend yourself in the space. And as you do that, you put your opponent in a, in a um, uncomfortable place, which is gonna shorten their breath, uh, quicken their breath, start to tire them. Uh, you get them acclimated to, a, to you standing closer than they would ideally want. 
uh, they get, once they're acclimated, you now have advantages that they're not quite aware of. Um, but it's the way this bubble is kind of like um, used. This is a pressuring fighter. For a defensive fighter, you want to see how, like a longer range fighter, you want to see how they are managing that bubble and keeping, let's say they're a longer range fighter with kicks and teeps and uh, maybe sudden long knees or something. How are they using that bubble to control what the other fighter is capable of? Um, this is one reason, as a side note, we asked Krongsok, a um, really good old Golden Age fighter uh, who fought uh, Rob Kamen uh, famously, uh, giving up a ton of weight. And we asked him, who would, like, who would win between Samard and Samrock? Two of the most artful fighters in the world like at the time, but also ever. Uh, very few more artful fighters. And he's like, what promoter would put that fight on? No one would pay to go to sleep. And the point, it, he is joking, he is making, he's a very funny guy. He is making this point about that styles make fights, matchups make fights and such. And this is true in Thai promoters are really good at finding the right style of uh, matchup. But these fighters, both of them actually use the bubble in the same way. But they're distance fighters and they manage the bubble from generally um, as a kind of like force field. So it would be two people using this defensive force field against each other. Um, and then it all come down to who lands the sudden electric strike. It actually make a marvelous chess match, but it wouldn't maybe be exciting in the traditional Thai sense of excitement. So that's the, that's the main thing I wanted to add with this video was this idea of just watching that. It's very hard to say, maybe it's something that develops over time when you watch these things, but watching that invisible space and how one fighter uses it, and sometimes it's with angles or rushes or just uh, darn tempo, uses it to affect the other fighter. This is the super high level of fighting excellence that was in the golden age. Um, but still is a key for me, a pleasure of watching contemporary fights. And then the other dimension of this, which is super um, interesting and important, and the way that Thai stadium classical fighting is different than m almost anywhere else in the world, is that Thai, Thai fights are a performance of storytelling. In the West, we are really, and maybe other parts of the world too, it's a kind of a globalized concept. It, we think of fights mathematically, like uh, as if you're playing a basketball game and if you score 30 points in the first quarter and you're ahead, it, it, it really doesn't matter at the end of the f game uh, whether you scored your points in the first quarter or in the last quarter. It matters to viewership, like if you're, if it's uh, an exciting um, world, world, cha uh, world championship series and it's a blowout in the third, in the first quarter, and then no, nobody gets close, you might even turn the, turn the game off. You want the thing to be like late third quarter, f early fourth quarter, one team just goes for the win and secures the win. We have in the West a very natural inclination towards narrative scoring, nor narrative uh, consum consumption or digestion of storyline. That's what governs Thai um, stadium fighting. Um, people in the West like to say that Thai scoring is inscrutable or, and, and yes, there's contemporary problems with uh, gamblers and pressures affecting judges, but in general, the most inscrutable thing about Muay Thai scoring in Thailand is that it's not numerical. You cannot score, generally, you cannot score points in the early rounds and have them, those points mean the same amount, the same impact 
is in the third and the fourth rounds of the fight. Just like in a movie, if you put all the drama in the first 20 minutes of the movie and not uh, at the beginning of the third act, an hour in, it, it doesn't cohere. And so what fighters are doing in Thailand traditionally is they're each telling a story, and this is the coolest thing about it, is that two fighters are trying to tell two different stories. It's a story battle. Yes, you can, af you can affect the story with damage. Like if you cut somebody or you uh, get an uh, eight count on somebody, this definitely is woven into the story. But those acts mean the most round three, round four. Westerners like to really kind of like be like, um, oh, fighters aren't really fighting in the first, and two, first two rounds, and then they quit fighting in the fifth round. Uh, let's just do away with them. Like now that's the, probably the, res the consequence or the reasoning behind um, the three round fight model that's kind of developed recently is they're like, let's cut out all the boring parts. Uh, there are arguments to be made for this. And yes, the marketplace is making its demands, but it would be like watching a movie and just being like, let's just cut to the fight scene or let's just cut to the murder scene. Uh, in well-fought fights, what is happening in the third and fourth round has already been kind of um, presaged in the early rounds. So when you're watching these early boring rounds, especially on more skill, skillful fighters, what you're seeing is sometimes fighters are sandbagging, they're hiding their best weapons and refusing to bring them out. And so they are kind of looking like they're overwhelmed. There's a real strong like cat and mouse kind of thing like, uh, uh, trying to make the odds swing and the people gamble round to round in the stands. So to make the odds swing against them so that they can then come behind and reveal their great strength. Or fighters could be like writing checks. We call it like writing checks. You write checks like you start that low kick going or you show that right hand is going to land. But you don't try to knock them out in the second round. You show it's going to land. You show that that right hand is going to be a problem for you later. And then you make it a real problem. You cash that check in the end of the third round, the beginning of the fourth round. This is the fucking cool thing about the narrative structure of uh, Thailand scoring. Um, it actually involves a much more connected and committed fighter to fight with subtlety. Um, yes, you can try to knock somebody out in the second round. Uh, and if you uh, count them or you do knock them out is great. But if you try to knock them out in the second round and then your energy, then the, the opponent survives it and then your energy drops, your effectiveness drops. The story that you've told is that you shot, you shot your wad kind of and you're like diminishing as the most important part of the fight is going on. So this is the one of the, this is probably the biggest key in understanding um, Thailand scoring and the way to watch fights is fighters are scripting. And, and for the, this feels kind of alien in a weird way, but when you really think about like, let's say appealing to the very like um, beautiful history of Western boxing, the greatest fights of Western boxing were like this. Like um, Muhammad Ali's rope a dope, and, and and actually Western boxing is, even though it's supposedly numerical uh, in its scoring, because it is of an older history, it has narrative dimensions to it. I forgot who it was it maybe George Foreman who was like Muhammad Ali was so hard to fight because he was a lamb for seven rounds and then he was a lion. That's an arc. That's a story that's being told. That, that because they have 15 round fights and whatnot, there's even more time to tell a story. And this, you're telling the story not only to judges, but you're telling the story to your opponent. You're raising their confidence and then you're crushing it.
So this is one of the cool, amazing things about um, Thailand's Muay Thai and why I kind of champion, let's not ruin this, lose this dimension for simply a video game style of scoring, like where you're just like, uh, points, 10-8, 10-9, points, points, how many points, how many significant strikes landed, like there's a very strong, like, I have an article that I wrote about this kind of like traditional sense of time and scoring that I believe actually goes to agrarian time, that um, instead of it being mathematical, kind of linear, mechanical, western, uh, modernist time, uh, the scoring arcs of Thailand uh, are agrarian, where things move in cycles and patterns of development, where you get uh, spring, summer, fall, winter. This arc, these arcs in the scoring actually harken back to a different concept of time that we as modern people are actually have lost largely because we're not surrounded by seasons often. Um, we don't have that same kind of connection and that Muay Thai's uh, narrative scoring actually uh, brings us back to another way of being, uh, which is really kind of beautiful. So anyways, that's my thought about this. Go watch Sylvie's answers too, because you can see the difference in how we think about things. And she's got way more knowledge than me. So what she has to say kind of like complements the other side of what I'm saying. And if you like these kinds of thoughts, Go watch your Muay Thai Bones. You can get the audio subscription. That podcast is just such an amazing thing to be a part of. It's like two, three hours of in-depth conversation, like very in-depth stuff on Muay Thai. Uh, as a patron, you, even a dollar patron, you can get the audio subscription, or you can watch the whole thing for free on YouTube in a playlist. Um, so if you made it this far, thank you very much for listening to my thoughts, and um, I'll see you at the next Muay Thai Bones.